or system. Uh, so, and I'm going to express some personal views as well. Uh, I'm quite opinionated on this topic, so I'll be interested in your feedback. As Mitri said, um, we're going to have lots of opportunity for Q &A, uh, uh, and A, and Mitri will interrupt me in the middle, uh, or Neil will, and ask uh, me to pause and answer some questions, and then at the end I'll leave um, around, or at least let's say, ten minutes for a discussion. So I'll shorten it as needed. Don't hesitate to interact. I, uh, I already know what I want to say, and I'm more interested in what, what your views are. And I, don't, I know we do have some experts I can see in the group. So I'm going to share a screen and, uh, and walk through some evidence supporting uh, the concerns that I mentioned about the lack of ampleness of reserves. Uh, if anybody has issues with sound or video, let me know, interrupt me. My, our, my collaborators are again shown on the screen here. And I, I caution this is preliminary work. As Mitri said, it's still being cleared by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for release. We hope that's gonna happen very soon. So let me just talk about uh, uh, the Fed's balance sheet policy uh, with respect to reserves. So as everybody knows, the Central Bank of the United States buys lots of assets from time to time, and it usually pays for most of those by depositing money in the accounts of banks that are held at the Federal Reserve. The, those central bank deposits are called reserve balances. Sometimes they're just called reserves. The, this diagram shows a time series of the total amount of reserve balances in the Federal Reserve System across all uh, depositors going back about five years, which is our sample period for this study. And we've broken it into three parts. The blue part at the bottom are the reserve balances of the largest dealer banks that intermediate the repo market, and uh, not to mention the derivatives markets in which you're all interested in, and bond markets. The red uh, component of this diagram is the total reserve balances of the remaining 100 largest banks in terms of their average balances over this period. And so you can see the top 100 banks have most of the reserve balances. The rest are over a couple of thousand other smaller banks that don't figure into our study at all. One of the predominant features of this diagram is that starting around the end of 2017, the Fed went on a program of quote unquote normalization. What does that mean? It means that the Fed decided it should have no larger a balance sheet than necessary to conduct its monetary policy. Uh, so there was basically eliminating, allowing treasury securities that it owned to mature and allowing the amount of reserves necessary to fund its purchases of assets to decline over time. And you can see that the amount of reserves reached an absolute minimum during the sample period around September 2019. Some of you may remember that in September 2019, there was a major disruption in US Treasury repo markets. And I want to talk about that. Uh, it's our finding in this paper that the Fed basically overshot or at least it's my view uh, that the Fed overshot in terms of balance sheet normalization. They thought that would be enough reserves in the system to meet uh, daily needs, and there wasn't. And because of that, there was a disruption that showed up not only in the treasury repo market, but in other ways that I'll get into later. So what happens when the treasury repo market gets disrupted by insufficient reserves is that the interest rate uh, that is charged for lending reserves in the repo market can jump up. And what you're looking at in this diagram uh, over our uh, part of our sample period is the difference between the interest rate that uh, is charged on repos and the interest rate that's offered by the Federal Reserve to banks. Now, a repo, the ones that repos that we're looking at are overnight, uh, uh, essentially loans. They're overnight financings backed 
100% or more by treasury securities. So they're effectively risk-free. Another effectively risk-free overnight investment is to park money at the Fed. If you're a bank, you can do that. So the first lesson uh, that we all learned back on page one of some finance book uh, is that when two investments are identical, they should have the same price. Or if two uh, cash-bearing uh, risk-free deposits or investments are identical, they should have the same interest rate. And the difference between the two investments that I mentioned, repos and Federal Reserve deposits, therefore should have been zero, but it wasn't. There were occasions on which the difference between them jumped a lot. In fact, it jumped even more than illustrated in this diagram because we truncated the difference at 200 basis points, which is a lot in the repo market. You can see that on various dates in 2018 and 19, leading uh, particularly into September 2019, there were big spikes uh, in the repo interest rate relative to the Federal Reserve deposit rate, which is called interest on reserves or IOER. Uh, after uh, 2019, uh, going back to the previous diagram, the Fed said, uh, oops, maybe we need to add more reserves. And then in March of 2020, when the pandemic news hit the market, markets were disrupted again, repo spreads jumped again substantially, uh, but then the Fed flooded the market with reserves, as you can see in this picture, after March, after the pandemic hit in March of 2020, and the spikes went away. There's basically been no such uh, spiky behavior or large differences between those two interest rates. I should mention there are two different interest rate interest rates for repos plotted here. One is called GCF. That's the interest rate on repos between major dealers. And the other one is called SOFR. Uh, that's the interest rate on average across the entire repo market, including the GCF market or interdealer market. And you can see that the GCF rates are higher than the average rate in the market, but basically both time series are showing very spiky behavior. Uh, and I'm not gonna make a big deal about the difference between the two, but if we get into a Q&A about the difference, there are some interesting differences, uh, but I won't have time to go into those today. So you can just think in terms of, for the rest of today, the average overnight interest rate in the US Treasury repo market. Here I'm showing the spike that happened in the average, that average interest rate in red on the right-hand scale went to over 300 basis points above the arbitrage free rate on September the 17th, 2019. And in blue, I'm showing the total amount of reserve balances that the largest 10 dealer banks that are active in repo markets had. And you can see that even after 2000, uh, 19 September spike, the Fed did add a lot of reserves to the system, but it didn't really have a big effect on the amount of reserves that were held by the largest 10 repo active dealer banks. That really only climbed after the March COVID uh, pandemic crisis hit the markets and the Fed purchased enormous amounts of treasuries to cure uh, dysfunction in the treasury market. That drove up the reserves, they, the Fed pays for its treasury purchases with reserves. That line went way up. And as I said, the repo rate flattened. Uh, the spread between repo and, and the interest rate paid by the Fed uh, basically disappeared. So this is superficially at least evidence that when you have enough reserves at the largest repo active dealer banks, they can intermediate the treasury market uh, and police that arbitrage. That is, buy low, sell high whenever two interest rates are far apart. But whenever you don't have enough reserve balances um, at the largest repo active dealer banks, uh, then occasionally they don't have enough reserves to lend out. And I'm gonna discuss why that may, may be the case. And I'm gonna be focusing most heavily on the fact that these large banks need to make hundreds of billions of dollars of payments in the middle of every day, 
And if they lend out their reserves into the repo market, uh, then they won't have enough reserves left to meet their payments and meet their regulatory requirements for having sufficient liquidity in the middle of the day. So this paper is really as much about the sufficiency of reserves for me meeting the needs of the payment system as it is about sufficiency of reserves to operate uh, the repo market with liquidity. So let me just, because uh, time is short, uh, just tell you in qualitatively uh, our conclusions and, uh, and then dive into more evidence. And then, as I said, take Q&A. And Anil is gonna interrupt me at any point if there's, a, if there's a, a clarifying or other question that he thinks is appropriate to ask uh, at an intermediate point like this. So here are, uh, here is a summary of four key points. First, uh, the Fed had used the word ample. It wanted to have an ample amount of reserves to meet the needs of, uh, of everything that banks needed to do with reserves. And as I mentioned, it turned out that they weren't so ample after all. Ample reserves are crucial for the intermediation of US dollar funding markets and for the management of intraday payments, which is, as I said, the dual implication of not having enough reserves is intraday payment management. The, the concern about US dollar funding markets, um, we're not a, a, the first to address that problem. There are a number of other papers. The most prominently um, is a paper by, a Fed paper by Correa, Du, and Liao. Um, uh, but we are adding uh, to that story. And we're also, um, I think for the first time, focusing on the critical aspect of having enough reserve balances to meet intraday payment needs and to meet liquidity requirements, uh, regulatory liquidity requirements. The second uh, aspect of our finding, which is also original, is that it's not the total amount of reserves in the system that really matters for the liquidity of funding markets. It's the amount of reserves held by, not surprisingly, the most active dealer banks, you know, the household names that you all know about, uh, that intermediate bond markets, derivatives markets, and repo markets. Now, I should say, we're focusing on the 10 largest repo active dealer banks, but I personally don't know literally who they are because those are high, the data we're using are highly confidential. Uh, they come from the Fedwire uh, data set, which I'll describe later. Uh, and uh, I, I can't uh, say for sure who they are, but I'm pretty sure who they are because I know who the largest uh, dealer banks are in the world uh, that are active in, in US uh, uh, repo and derivatives markets. And I'm sure they include firms like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, City, uh, Citigroup, Bank of America, and so on. And also we're including foreign branch, uh, foreign banks that are active in US markets. I, again, I just don't know which, if any, are in that. The reserve balances of the other banks are not directly important for offering rates in the repo market, but they are important in determining stress on intraday payments for these repo active banks. Let me repeat that. The 100, the 100 banks that we're looking at are split in two. There's 10 active dealer banks. The other 90 banks, their reserve balances are important for the following reason. If they don't have a lot of balances, then as you will see, they're going to pay the repo active dealer banks later in the day. They're going to hold back on their reserves. They're going to hoard their cash uh, and pay later in the day. When the repo active dealer banks realize that, they say, uh-oh, we're not going to get paid very early. That means we better be cautious with our cash balances. We better not lend out into the repo market unless we get a very high compensating interest rate. And that's where those spikes are coming from. It's a very simple story. And I'm going to mention some theory uh, towards uh, the end today uh, by one of our collaborators, uh, David Elin Yang, who's present today, uh, that describes that uh, cash hoarding behavior and the feedback effects associated with it. Because if one bank is going to hold back and the other banks realize that the other banks are holding back, they're all going to hold back in a self-fulfilling way. And that's David's theory. That's going to be his job market paper.
And then finally, uh, there are additional sources of stress on the availability of reserve balances for making payments and for the repo market. And that those additional sources of stress that we discovered are prominent in causing these spikes in rates are issuances of new treasury securities by the US Treasury Department. When those treasury securities are issued, the dealer banks have to pay for them first thing in the morning and they have to pay for them with reserves. Uh, those reserves get extinguished. They just disappear from the reserve balances of all banks and go into the treasury special account at the Fed, become unavailable to the market. That adds stress to the repo market, not just because there's less balances, but also because the dealers have to pay first thing in the morning so don't have access. There's no timing option anymore about when to use those balances. The timing is determined by early payment to the treasury. Uh, so this, this problem that cropped up in September 2019, this giant spike in repo markets, uh, received a lot of attention. Our paper highlights all of the big news stories in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Bloomberg, and so on. And uh, Jamie Dimon was asked right after that spike in the third quarter uh, earnings call for JP Morgan, you had a lot, the, basically the reporter or the analyst that uh, asked him this question was basically saying, you had lots of reserve balances at the Fed. When you saw those interest rate spikes, why didn't you arbitrage them, buy low, sell high? And uh, Diamond uh, made a very revealing answer to that question on his earnings call. And I'm just gonna read it verbatim. We have a checking account at the Fed, uh, parenthetically, that's the reserve balances that the JP Morgan holds at the Fed, with a certain amount of cash in it. Last year, 2018 that is, we had more cash than we needed for regulatory requirements. So when repo rates went up, we went from the checking account, which was paying interest on excess reserves, into repo, parenthetically, doing the arbitrage, buy low, sell high. Diamond continues, obviously makes sense. You make more money. But now the cash in the account which is still huge. It's 120 billion in the morning, parenthetically, that's the opening balances of JP Morgan at the Fed on a typical morning, and goes down to 60 billion during the course of the day and back to 120 billion at the end of the day. That cash we believe is required under resolution and recovery and liquidity stress testing. So these last three uh, technical words, resolution, recovery, and liquidity stress testing, those are referring to new regulatory requirements mandating that banks have plenty of intraday liquidity. And, uh, and basically what Jamie Dimon is saying, we didn't wanna trip any regulatory red lines. He actually used the word red lines later in this earnings call. And so even though they could have arbitraged this uh, big spread between repo rates and the interest rate they were getting at the Fed, they chose not to because they didn't want to take any risk of violating their regulatory requirements, which is clearly much more important to a large bank with a big reputation to protect. You don't want your supervisor, if you're on the repo desk, to send you a note saying, uh, we'd like to talk to you because we noticed that you didn't meet your intraday liquidity requirements, and you would avoid that at all costs. I'm gonna skip this slide because otherwise I'm gonna run out of time, but I'm gonna talk about this slide about overdrafts. So what is an overdraft? This is when a bank actually runs its balances below zero. And uh, since the financial crisis, the largest banks are not doing that because of the regulatory reasons that I mentioned, but system-wide, uh, there are overdrafts in the system and what's plotted here are the opening day balances of the our sample of 100 large banks on the horizontal axis and the peak daylight overdrafts in the system over two week maintenance periods in our sample and those dots as you can see are pretty much lined up to show that there's a very significant relationship with an r squared of 0.57 
between the amount of balances the banks have and the amount of overdrafting that they're doing. At the very top left corner of the scatter plot, we colored in red September the 17th, the period covering September the 17th, 2019. That was the spike day. On that day, the opening balances of these banks were at a record minimum and the peak daylight overdraft was at a record maximum. Those are not unrelated facts. Those are saying the system doesn't have enough balances. Some banks are overdrafting and the largest repo active dealer banks on those days are probably feeling the stress on their intraday payments, just like Jamie Dimon said. This is a, a diagram showing the normal volume distribution across the day in these bars. Uh, in blue on normal days and in red on crunch days, meaning days on which there was a spike in repo rates, uh, this one of these disruptions. And you can see that normal volumes are very large early in the morning in the interdealer market. So rates are being basically the color of the market, the pricing is being set early in the morning based on how much opening balances that the banks have among other conditions. This is a chart showing that in those first 20 minutes of the day, the rate being set in the market in excess of the interest rate paid by the Fed on the horizontal axis is highly related to the times at which the dealers are getting their balances. Now I'm gonna to need to unpack that. So again, on the horizontal axis, this is the repo rate Sp uh, a spread that I've been talking about uh, since the beginning this morning. And on the vertical axis, 100 means that the 10 large repo active dealer banks are getting paid on that day, 100 minutes later than normal. They're getting paid, uh, that is, half of their incoming payments are being received 100 minutes later than normal. So this is the median payment time relative to normal. 100 minutes late means those large repo active dealer banks are experiencing a day on which their incoming payments are low and they better watch out in terms of having enough intraday balances to meet their own payment needs and to meet the needs of regulators that Jamie Dimon mentioned. And you can see the collection of red dots on the right hand side are the days on which repo rates spiked. Those are the crunch days in the repo market. And again, the upper rightmost dot is September the 17th, 2019, the day on which a lot of stress appeared. So summary to this point, not enough balances introduces a likelihood of stress on intraday payments and elevated repo rates elevated relative to the efficient market level, which is the interest rate paid by the Fed on central bank deposits. So Neil, if there are any questions uh, clarifying or otherwise, I could take them now. And if okay. not, I'll continue. Okay, yes. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of questions. I, I thought they could have waited to the end, but I'll ask them now. From Asaf Manella, two questions. Why should the Fed care about those spreads widening temporarily? That was the first question. And two, why must it be deposit insured banks that are these spreads as opposed to say hedge funds? Okay, so first, well, the second question is probably the easier one. Uh, the only institutions or investors in the world that are capable of arbing these spreads are regulated banks. And that's because only banks can hold deposits at the Fed with very minor exceptions. Uh, there is a few pieces of market infrastructure and some other odds and ends, but basically government entities uh, and banks are the only investors that are able to arb the spread. And on the first point, I'm gonna go back to this slide and it's a good question. Why would the Fed care that these spreads exist? Why wouldn't the Fed just want, uh, just, you know, why, why would the Fed want this spread to be near zero? Why would it care that it's spiking or that it's far from zero? Uh, well, uh, again, going back to um, violations of the law of one price, we would guess there is, that there's a market friction that might matter when there's a violation of the law of one price. So what it basically means is that some buyers and some sellers who would otherwise exchange, in other words, make a, a gain from trade are not going to do that. 
because they're facing two different interest rates. Uh, so it's a disruption in, in what the Fed calls the transmission of monetary policy into markets. The Fed wants, when, it, the, when the Fed sets the interest rate at the central bank, they want the interest rates in wholesale markets to track that. Now, they don't mind if it's a few basis points different, but I don't think uh, the Fed would say that it's okay that they're spiking by large amounts. Another reason that it might matter to the Fed is that it speaks to the issue of financial stability. What if there were cash hoarding? The cash hoarding is a source of incentive for these rates to spike. So the fact that the rates are spiking is one thing, but if it signals that there may not be enough cash in the system and some banks are holding back cash because they're frightened about not having enough during the day, that could turn into a vicious feedback effect. And that's been discussed in various cases. A famous case, for example, is the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center, when because Citibank was knocked out of the payment system, there was a lot of cash that was trapped and other banks said, uh-oh, we're not gonna get a lot of the money we need. They started to hold back on their payments and the system was um, in line for freezing up, a big financial stability problem. Fortunately, the Fed reacted very quickly in that case. But whenever you get this kind of a freeze up or uh, cash hoarding behavior, it's a source of financial instability. Markets are not going to be liquid during, during those times, and there may actually be some people that suffer a liquidity crisis. Small dealers in the repo market did experience liquidity crisis on September the 17th, 2019. And it could have been bigger had the Fed not acted quickly. I'm going to keep going. Here's the relationship uh, between the balances held by the other 90 banks among our top 100 and the time at which the large dealer banks receive their incoming payments. So let me repeat on the horizontal axis, take the 90 banks that are not the large repo active dealer banks, add up their balances each day. And that, as you can see, that ranges between about 700 billion and about 1.6 trillion. And then look at for each day, what was the time of day by which the largest repo active dealer banks had received half of their incoming payments? And you can see a clear relationship. These other banks, even though they're not active in repo markets and they're not directly responsible for the repo rate spikes, when they have low balances, they're paying the large dealer banks later in the day. And the large dealer banks are saying, uh-oh, we're getting paid late today. We better be conservative in the repo market and not give away all of our reserves at cheap interest rates. We're gonna quote high interest rates for financing in the reserve re in, in the repo market. A very strong relationship, the R squared is 0.69. Okay, let's just look at uh, now, finally, we're getting to an actual uh, statistical model, very, very simple statistical model. Uh, in which we're going to try to explain this median time of receives and relate it to some of the key variables that I've mentioned. So first on the, the time of day by, again, we're explaining when do the dealer banks get half of their incoming payments on a given day. The first uh, regression is simply um, maybe the opening balances of the dealer banks themselves is important. Well, there's a very strong statistical relationship, although the R squared is pretty small at 14%. So let me skip that one. What about these other large balances? Well, I just plotted that a moment ago. It's this diagram. It's a very strong relationship, a 69% R squared. And you can see a big effect. By the way, these uh, balances are in trillions. Uh, so when the other bank balances go down a trillion, uh, the uh, large dealer banks are getting paid uh, let's see, controlling for nothing else, uh, 209 minutes later, uh, the, but the standard deviation of other bank balances is not that big. The uh, third column combines the two. It doesn't give you that much more R squared. The fourth column, where you're gonna use the repo rate spread and see, is there a relationship by which the interest rate spread, this arbitrage spread, uh, this inefficiency in repo rates is a predictor for 
uh, late payment timing? And the answer is definitely, uh, it's a closely related variable. The next uh, reg regression number five is the balances of the hundred large banks. Oh, that's the one that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, sorry, I haven't shown you that one, but that's also a strong relationship, not as large as the other large banks. Uh, then we're going to combine various uh, other variables, and I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor these. But basically, uh, there's a very it, it is possible to predict payment timing reasonably well. As you can see, you can get up into R squareds of over 80 percent with just three variables. Uh, so uh, it's kind of predictable that when you don't have enough balances in the system, you're going to be causing payment timing stress. This, by the way, is a uh, uh, is not um, uh, all that surprising. And you can see it, for example, in some of the earlier work of my collaborator, Adam Copeland at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York with uh, Tarashina and Malloy. But here we've added some new insights into that payment timing stress. I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. And I'm gonna talk about the spread between repo rates and IOER. Now we're going to try to explain the other signal that we have of stress in funding markets associated with insufficient balances. Remember, the first of this uh, two pillar approach was payment timing. The second is this divergence of repo rates from the efficient market level, which is the interest paid on excess reserves by the Fed. And again, I'm going to go across this table and look at what variables help us understand uh, this, uh, this uh, inefficiency in repo rates. The first variable is the dealer opening balances. Uh, it has very strong statistical relationship. It doesn't explain a huge fraction of the variation, but it's important. And obviously, when the dealers have lower balances, they're going to be more concerned about lending money in the repo rate in the repo market and they're going to charge higher rates. And it's a, a significant effect. You'll see a quarter end fixed effect. And that's not really part of our story today. But if you don't control for it, you miss an important story, which is that at the end of each quarter, foreign banks, not US banks, foreign banks are monitored for capital sufficiency by regulators. And they tend to pull out of funding markets when they get monitored. And that puts more um, demand on the US banks who then quote higher interest rates. And it's about a 13 basis point effect if you don't control for other stuff. The third column is the, shows the effect of the single most important variable, which is the median time of receives. This is the time at which the dealers, the 10 large dealer uh, banks active in the repo market are getting paid half of their incoming payments. So if it's by two o'clock in the afternoon, they're half incoming payments. Uh, that could be late in the day, and that could cause them to worry that they won't have enough funding to meet all of their payment needs and satisfy regulators. And you can see that explains a significant fraction of variation in the data. A hundred minutes later is an extra 14 basis points of spread now we're going to start combining various variables. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skip across and talk about the treasuries. So in the very last column seven, I'm not going to talk about all these variables, but I'm going to talk about treasury issuance because this also puts stress on repo markets. When the treasury, when the US Treasury Department issues new treasury securities, the dealers bid for those treasury securities and they have to pay for them two days later, typically. And on the day of issuance, when they pay for those securities, they need to pay first thing in the morning. The Treasury Department requires that. And if they're going to have to pay first thing in the morning, they're going to say, uh-oh, not only are we going to have lower balances today, we're going to have to have lower balances from the beginning. So we've lost all options for timing our outgoing payments with respect to these Treasury issuances. And that puts more stress on us. And those reserves just disappear from the, uh, the banking system. They go to the treasury where they're locked up into the treasury's general account, cannot be used in the repo market. So that is a supply effect, which is pretty important. 
when treasuries are issued, there's also a demand effect because now you have these new treasury securities that are suddenly out and floating around in the market and need to be financed in the repo market. Many of them, the investors that buy them are going to want to borrow money to finance their position and they borrow money in the repo market and that adds additional stress to repo rates. And so you can see that the effect is quite significant, especially for coupon securities because coupon securities are the most actively uh, traded in the repo market. The treasury bills also significant because they take reserves out of the system, but they're not that actively used in the repo market. So the difference is about a 25 basis point uh, effect between 38 basis points and 63 and a half basis points. So um, I'm going to I'm going to now turn uh, to a kind of wrap up of why is this what you know what is the underlying uh, mechanics going on here, and uh, I've already addressed the question, which was a very good question: Why should the Fed care? Or why should anyone care? So I won't need to emphasize that too much anymore. Uh, I'm going to skip those policy issues, and I'm going to go directly to uh, a the to uh, trying to get a theoretical understanding by bringing in some new results by um, our collaborator, David Elin Yang. So this is a diagram I already showed you earlier. Uh, and what we wanna know is why is it uh, that when the dealers have low balances that you get these disruptions in repo markets and funding markets and you get late payment timing? What is it about, you know, why should this be a spike? Why is it not a continuous effect? If you look at the blue line going into September of last year, the blue line is only moving continuously down. And so you would think, okay, a little bit more down should mean a little bit higher repo rate. But instead, there was a big spike. And this is kind of understated uh, because it's, while it's huge, 315 basis points, it was three times bigger in the interdealer market during the day. It was up to a thousand basis points out of whack on that day. So how could a very small adjustment in reserve balances in blue cause a huge spike in red? And here's David's, uh, uh, and, and you can ask him a question, he's also here. Here's David's idea for this, which is he does a game theoretic uh, approach to this of strategic uh, timing behavior in the intraday payment market. And the idea is pretty simple. Uh, suppose, suppose uh, you know, Christian is a bank and he's thinking to himself, is this going to be one of those stress days? Well, I don't know. I, my, all the signals that I have, you know, I have low balances. I see that other banks may have low balances. This could be one of those days. And if on the horizontal axis, Christian thinks maybe we're going to get below some threshold mark T on this diagram at which the other banks will start to pay later in the day, which means I won't be getting my money as quickly as I need it to meet all my requirements. So I should conserve money too. And meanwhile, the other banks like uh, Dimitri and Neil, they're saying, oh, this could be one of those days on which Christian is holding back on his reserves in the middle of the day because he thinks that we're not gonna pay him early in the day, we're gonna pay late. So indeed, we'd better pay him later in the day. And you get this feedback effect, which causes a threshold jump in the repo rate that Christian, Neil, and Dimitri are all willing to offer to lend in the repo market. So it's not a continuous effect as suggested by those spikes. You can get cash hoarding, and that connects uh, not only with the literature that I mentioned that's cited uh, uh, in the bottom of this uh, figure, uh, but it's also connected with the financial stability concern that I mentioned earlier, because even though the repo rate spike in and of itself it need not be a, a disaster, uh, if the Fed doesn't swoop in quickly and rescue the market with more funding, it could cause a freeze up in cash payments. People could all decide they're going to wait until later in the day. This has been discussed in a, this, this cash hoarding idea has been discussed anecdotally and empirically in earlier work. And I think David is the first person that nailed, has nailed it in terms of a game theoretic uh, analysis of this market. Okay, that's the end of my prepared uh, remarks. And uh, we have about 15 minutes left for discussion.
I'm happy to go into any uh, any of these issues. All right. So now I will I will um, read some of the remaining questions from the chat, but also at this time, um, anyone who wants to should feel free to unmute themselves and ask questions, ask questions orally. But anyway, I will, um, I'll, I'll look at, I'll read some of the outstanding questions from the chat. So one question, if reserve balances are the main issue, shouldn't we observe a similar pattern in the Fed funds market? Great question. And the answer is yes. And we did, although it was somewhat muted relative to the repo rate spikes. And we should also see it in any funding market. And the paper I mentioned by Correa, Du, and Liao shows a noted spike in the violation of covered interest parity in the foreign exchange forward market. This is sometimes called the cross-currency basis. So they show that in all markets affected uh, by reserve balances, where the sufficiency of reserve balances should matter, there were spikes in funding market rates. The repo rate spikes were the most heavily noted. This is the largest market. It happens that these days, since the Fed has changed its um, monetary policy framework after the financial crisis, the Fed funds market is kind of a small side show not that exciting anymore because uh, banks are not really lending to banks very much in the fed funds market it's basically an artifact of agencies federal government agencies lending money to foreign banks because the government agencies happen not to get any interest on their federal reserve deposits uh, so the fed funds market is not really a great place to look but it did show some of these distortions okay another question uh, do your results suggest that the current rules that require the large banks to hold sufficient reserves at every point in time are too taxing? And that, for example, switching to a requirement that they hold sufficient reserves as of the close of business might be better? Okay. Uh, that you, the, the, the alternative regulation that you described was in place before uh, 2008, and I'm going to do a screen share and show you the slide that I skipped that addresses that issue. Let me go to this picture. So this is the picture that goes with your question or your questioner, Neil. Before the financial crisis, indeed, uh, the Fed didn't expect banks to have big cash buffers in the middle of the day. They only needed to see it at the end of the day. And because of that, the banks ran much higher daylight overdrafts in those days. And we did not have these problems or as many problems of this type in repo markets, despite be there being actually much fewer reserves in the system. Post-crisis, peak daylight overdrafts are much smaller in magnitude, even though um, you have these, stress these stresses in, in funding markets. And the reason is those heavy liquidity requirements. So what should the Fed do? Well, the Fed actually did in, uh, in the pandemic uh, events of this, of, of March, 2020, completely eliminate any penalties for daylight overdrafts and encourage banks to run daylight overdrafts to improve the funding liquidity of markets. There, these other requirements that Jamie Dimon mentioned, however, recovery, resolution, and stress testing are still on the books and banks are very reluctant to run against those. One possible approach that's been mentioned is to count towards their liquidity requirements access to the Federal Reserve's discount window. Vice Chair Quarles of the Fed mentioned maybe we should do that so that they don't feel like they need to have actual cash deposits at the Fed if they just count towards their requirements, their access or their credit line at the discount window, then that, uh, then that might alleviate this problem. But in the meantime, the banks are still uh, feel very much that they don't want to run those liquidity buffers down. And that's why that they charge higher rates when they don't have enough reserves. For the, for the time being, by the way, uh, there's plenty of reserve balances in the system because an, a, a byproduct of the pandemic crisis is that the Fed purchased trillions, literally, of treasuries in 2020, and it paid for those with reserves. So now there's a true ample 
supply of reserves. So our paper is kind of irrelevant until the Fed goes back to its normalization policy because there is truly ample reserves at this point. Okay, um, then from Gustavo Schwenkler, there's what I guess is more of a comment than a question, but I'll read it anyway and give you and give you a chance to respond to it. Um, whoop, now, oh, uh, looking at the figure in slide nine and the table on slide 11, it seems that the relationship between spreads and payment timing may be driven by five or so extreme outliers. Have you examined the robustness of the results after removing outliers? The outliers are what you're interested in. If removing the outliers undoes the relationship between spreads and payment timing, that may just suggest that the results are driven by some sort of events that occurred on those extreme days. And the answer, that's a very good question. We wouldn't want our uh, putative uh, strong relationships to be driven only by the spikes. So of course the spikes are not, I wouldn't call them outliers. They're the interesting, they are the interesting observations, not outliers in the sense that they should be uh, dis disregarded or downplayed because uh, they don't, they're not uh, typical. But we did look at that and uh, let me show you some um, scatter plots that may help. So this is the scatter plot on peak overdrafts. And you can see uh, that there are outliers, but that the relationship holds right across the board. This is the relationship uh, on uh, median payment time uh, versus repo rate spread. This is the relationship between median payment time and balances. So the outliers here are not causing a big effect. And when we talk about uh, this relationship between SOFR and IOR, this is the repo rate spread. We actually did uh, run the full battery of regression analysis, excluding all of the spike days. And the R squareds are only higher, not lower. And that the reason is that even though the spikes are roughly in line with the theory, they're noisier. And if you take out those noise, noise levels, you get an even tighter relationship uh, between repo rate spreads and these explanatory variables. The R squares are substantially higher. And that's, uh, well, the paper's not out yet, but that's in an appendix of the paper. All right, um, another question. Can you say something about the uncertainty in the payment timing? Does it help to reduce the timing uncertainty? In other words, what is the cost if all banks are forced to specify the exact timing of their payments? Uh, that's a, a really interesting question. Uh, so here, I'm gonna speculate because that's, that's a counterfactual, it's hard to analyze, but here's my speculation. The only way you could, uh, you could enforce such a rule is to tell banks when they will make payments. You can't tell them when they're gonna receive payments because that's not up under their control. If you tell them, uh, you know, if you say to Jamie Dimon, you will be making a quarter of your payments by nine o'clock, half of your payments by noon, three quarters by 2 p.m. and the rest by the end of the day. What is Jamie Dimon going to say with respect to what he tells his repo traders about how freely to lend money? He's going to say, I want you to be even more careful than you have been before this new payment timing rule, because now you have a very rigid outgoing payment schedule. You have no more flexibility. This is no longer, you've lost the American option on when to use those balances. So if you lose optionality, you need to be more conservative, not less conservative. So I would say that might be not good in terms of funding market liquidity. It might be, there might be a way to um, make that rule a little bit more dynamic so that we, you know, for example, suppose we say your outgoing payments can depend on certain variables, but they shouldn't depend as heavily on incoming payments as they have been. So if we could enforce a rule like that, we could try to cut that feedback loop and, uh, and that might help because we want to try to cut back that negative feedback effect of banks paying later because they're getting paid by others later in the day. Uh, so there may be a way to not a fixed payment timing schedule, but some policy on payment timing that could help. That said, you know, okay. banks only have a certain amount of discretion with the balances that they have. 
and you know, they need to meet their obligations. And if they don't have a lot of balances, there's not that much they can do by just retiming the payments. Can okay, I have so a quick follow-up? Go, go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Hi, this is Hong Jun. Uh, good to see you, Dario. Oh, Hong um, Jun. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I ask about the uh, timing uncertainty, what I had in mind is something like, can you have people clear their, uh, all the payments at the end of the day or something like that? By okay. doing this, you are effectively getting around the requirement of intraday balance. That's right. That would be great from the viewpoint of netting because now you could net all of your incomings against all of your outgoings. Exactly. However, your many of your customers might be very disappointed. One of them being the US Treasury Department, which insists on getting paid first thing in the day. But many other customers say, look, we need to make our tax payments today to the government right out of our reserve, uh, uh, you know, our accounts that are gonna be coming through reserve balances. And we, and we want uh, to see those taxes paid by no later than noon. We don't wanna be worried that maybe we made a mistake and didn't leave enough balances. We don't want any, any issues here. We, and so please pay that for us by noon and others uh, uh, you know, many customers will have reasons uh, that they that they want it, uh, to pay others early in the middle of the day. You could go the other way on this, and I think this might be a good idea, is to have an intraday market where instead of just using discretion and uh, suffering this negative feedback effect, there is a market for when you get paid in the day. Uh, so either you can do it in terms of I will pay you more interest if you pay me back early in the day, or I will pay you a fee if you make my payments early in the day. If we set up a market for intraday payments, uh, then as everybody knows, again, from textbook uh, analysis, the allocation of uh, reserves during the day is gonna be more efficient because it's priced in a market rather than up to discretion. I see, all right, thanks. So I, I just I'll just emphasize now that you know anyone who wants to um, should feel free uh, to unmute themselves and ask the question orally. Uh, but anyway, um, I'll, I'll read one more question. Um, isn't it more important for reserves to be ample for small banks instead of large banks? Uh, the small banks won't need to borrow from big, big banks if their reserves are ample. Uh, well, okay, so there's a number of issues here. So first of all, uh, if the small banks don't have enough reserves, yes, they can borrow them from big banks. And big banks do tend to be the hub sources of reserves in the system. So small banks actually get, the smallest banks get their money from regional banks, which are midsize. The regional banks get them from the largest money center banks in New York, which are City, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan. And uh, that kind of hub and spoke uh, network structure is quite efficient in terms of funneling the money from uh, where, where, to, to where it's needed from where it's not necessarily needed. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, it's all that important that the small banks have ample opening day balances because they're not intermediating markets. They're just consumers in the reserves markets. And as long as they're able to borrow reserves from the bigger banks, they're gonna be fine. And, and that's a very typical thing. When the Fed has enormous amounts of reserves like it does today, um, nobody's, in, nobody's hurting for reserves. Everyone is stuffed with reserves. And some of the banks are saying, no mas, I've had enough reserves. Uh, because I have regulatory capital requirements, even on my reserves. You might say, well, why would a bank ever have to have a regulatory capital requirement on a central bank deposit? They're so safe. But there is a rule in, in, uh, that's called the leverage ratio rule that says you need capital requirements even for central bank deposits. So many banks are saying, don't want any more. Thank you, I got plenty. <laughs> Does anybody want my reserves? Daryl, thank you. This is Dan Lee. I was the one who asked the question about the small banks. And by yeah. small bank, I was more I was more referring to banks that typically borrow in the interdealer repo market. Oh. Um, because in in in, in uh, during the, the repo spike, right? It's it's more the the rate that uh, the JP Morgans of the world uh, lend to the other banks. The, the, those rate that jumped more. And 
uh, I was more thinking that it's more important for those what one, the ones that tend to be the borrower in that market to have ample reserve yeah. rather than the intermediaries that uh, tend to be the lender. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Uh, nice to speak with you again. The the Same market here. participants that are most squeezed on these crunch days are the non the the not the largest repo banks, but the smaller dealers in the repo market. They're desperate, and I had some calling me early in the morning on September 17th uh, saying, uh, what the hell is going on? We can't seem to get any money at rates less than 500, per, 500 basis points above IOR and we're getting killed. The, the person literally used that word. So those, yeah, they are borrowing from the largest banks and they were really getting squeezed. And you could see it in the interdealer repo rates, which were way higher than uh, the average repo rates in the market. They went up to a thousand basis points on September the 17th of 2019. So I totally agree. Most of those are not actually banks. Most of them are non-bank dealers um, uh, and they really got hit very hard. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Okay, um, actually another question. You have several pages or two, at least two tables of regression results that you know seem like very high correlations. So are you thinking that we should place a causal interpretation on those regression results? That's a very perceptive question. Uh, and so we have a language in our paper that cautions very much against taking a causal uh, interpretation, especially of the relationship between the repo rate spread and balances. And this is a classic problem of estimating elasticities. If you try to regress a price on a quantity, you're gonna have problems because the quantity responds endogenously to the price. Now we did try to address that uh, by using a, um, an instrumental variables approach. The first stage of which we try to predict opening balances the next day and then use predicted opening balances uh, uh, as a uh, variable to explain the repo rate spread. Even that however is treacherous because the variables with which you're predicting opening balances are themselves endogenous. So all we can say, and this is kind of the good news part of it, is that when you account for endogeneity, the effects are much bigger. Why? Well, because what is gonna happen if repo rates are expected to be very high? Then dealers will say, ah, oh, we better get more balances. We're gonna respond endogenously. So our balances will be higher than they otherwise would have been and then the repo rate will respond by being less than it otherwise would have been. And so the, the regressions that you have seen today are understating the sensitivity of repo rate distortions to opening balances because of the endogenous movement of reserve balances. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that is borne out by our instrumental variable regressions as, as imperfect as they are the effects are roughly twice as big uh, when we use a two-stage uh, instrumental variables approach. Now that's still, uh, we're still not claiming that we've na nailed the causal relationship. Even if you put aside all of the regressions, I would be happy, at least speaking for myself, to argue causality based on very simple observations. If you just listen to what I said during the course of the last hour, you would be hard pressed to find any other natural story for why it's the case that when balances in the system go down, payment timing becomes much later and you get massive distortions in repo rates. Uh, so if anyone can come up with a different causal story, I would be very anxious to hear it. I see no such story uh, that's plausible. So again, just arguing, uh, uh, qualitatively, um, the, the causal relationship has got to be very strong. The problem in our paper is that the quantification of it is very difficult to do because of endogeneity. All right. Um, are there any other questions? If you have a question, now is the time to shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> 